Hello. I have to say that this talk has evolved dramatically over the past few weeks. I was going to tell you all about how 10 years ago this month, I graduated from the University of Michigan. <laughs> Go blue. Yeah, I was going to tell you how I was 22 then. I'm 32 now. I was a student then. I'm a teacher now. 10 years ago, I was sleeping on a mattress on the floor of my friend's room, and now I'm not. <laughs> I was going to tell you how 10 years ago, I walked into the lobby of National Geographic in Washington, D.C., called up to the design director's office from the security phone and asked for an interview. How I got one, I ended my dream job and slowly worked my way up, designing pieces like this, and this, and this. I was going to tell you about all that, and then I went to an art museum, our art museum, and I had an idea. But first, I want to tell you about this kind of weird thing I like to do. Whenever I go to an art museum, especially if I'm seeing a retrospective like the El Anatsui show over at UMA, I seek out the timeline of the artist's life. And then I add my age to the artist's birth date to find the point on the timeline when the artist would have been the age that I am now. Maybe some of you do this, too. <laughs> Maybe not. But in the case of El Natsui, when he was 32, he was also a teacher. And that year, he had his first major solo exhibition. But the centerpieces of his recent international stardom, well, he didn't even begin sculpting with bottle caps until 2002, at the age of 58. When I read this, I was like, <sighs> all right, no need to panic. There's still time. But then I started to think about other artists. I mean, didn't Picasso redefine painting at age 26? And that is when I got the idea. Yeah. I would compile a huge list of all the artists and works that I had admired, find the dates and ages in which they were created, and then plot them on a chart, thereby unlocking some universal secret of peak creativity. <laughs> and why stop with artists? I mean, I'd always wanted to learn more about classical music, and by more, I really mean anything. Uh, I mean, in my mind, there might as well have been one immortal composer responsible for arranging everything ever <laughs> involving violins. <laughs> Same thing with poetry. I mean, up until a few weeks ago, when I really started on this project, uh, pretty much the only poems I really knew were by Robert Frost. And so I wasn't too proud of that. So off to the library I went, bringing on home load on load of poetry anthologies and classical music CDs, turned my house into a laboratory, a very unscientific one. See, I decided pretty early on that I was only going to chart the lives of people whose work I directly seen, read, or heard. And for each person, I would select one signature work. When choosing between, say, three operas by one composer, I went with the one that blew my hair back. Today, I'd like to share what I found so far. Here you're looking at the lives of 177 artists, composers, poets, scientists, and software developers from the year 1300 until today. Uh, there's a lot of fine details, so I made a large print that's going to be hanging in the lobby. Uh, you can see and explore in more detail. Now, we all start out together uh, in the center as babies. And then we gradually distinguish ourselves as we grow older. I scrapped my original talk because as I got deeper into studying these lives and stories of creativity, I, I thought that maybe this exploration would hold some interest for you, too. And maybe you also hear stories of Mozart composing at age five or hear about college dropout billionaires and occasionally ask yourself, am I past my prime? Well, I'm here to tell you, maybe. <laughs> but not necessarily. <laughs> Let me show you. First off, at age 22, the age of many of you here in this room, nearly everyone on this chart was untapped. A solid 60% of these masterpieces were created by people in their 30s and their 40s. I call this the donut of peak creativity. Mar <laughs> Marie Curie discovered uh, radioactivity at age 31. 
Michelangelo finished the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel at 37. Gustav Mahler completed his epic Fifth Symphony when he was 42. Now sure, some scientists and artists, composers and poets continue to produce into their 50s and 60s, but you know, just from this small sampling, I saw that after age 69, production drops off precipitously, which I take to mean I'm not waiting around till retirement to get started. Now, I also noticed that precocity seems to be somewhat contagious. Of all the works produced before age 30, most clustered together within three distinct periods. The revolutionary zeal of early 19th century Europe, where you get Shelley, Keats, Jericho, Chopin. The modern frenzy bracketing World War I with Picasso, Stravinsky, Niels Bohr, Ezra Pound, T.S. Eliot. And of course, the recent tech boom of the new millennium with Steve Jobs, Larry Page, Sergey Brin, Mark Zuckerberg. The pattern here seems to be that whenever there's a revolution, be it with bombs, bayonets, or bites, youth are leading the charge. Now here's where it gets really interesting for me. I'd set out to find this secret of when we do our best work, and as I got into exploring these lives, I realized I was asking the wrong question. <laughs> See, we each have a unique temperament. Some of us are extroverted, some of us are introverted, some are passive, some are aggressive, some are passive-aggressive, <laughs> whatever. And this temperament influences how and when we make our work. Some are tortoises, some are hares. But that's only half the story. See, we each also have a unique set of life experiences that shape not only what we make, but why. Why do we make what we make? Well, for starters, it depends on where we're from. Cezanne grew up in Provence, spent his childhood days hiking through quarries, bathing in streams, and reading poetry under pine trees with his pal Emile Zola. It's no coincidence then that he would continue to draw from these motifs and memories for the rest of his life, creating a body of work culminating in his large bathers at age 67. Now Cezanne was a homebody, the composer Bela Bartok was a vagabond. To distance himself from the Mainstream music coming out of Vienna and Berlin in the early 20th century, he literally distanced himself, going on research expeditions to Transylvania, Croatia, Turkey, Algeria, using the iPhone of his day, the phonograph, shown here, to sample the sounds of local folk songs. He would then come home and take these samples and remix them into compositions like this one. The Wedding from Three Village Scenes. Bartok shows us that what we make is not only a result of where we're from, but also where we go. Why do we make what we make? Well, sometimes the reasons are out of our control. We're influenced by what happens to us. The poet Elizabeth Bishop, when she was eight months old, her father died. Her mother was institutionalized shortly thereafter. As a result, Bishop went on to live with her grandmother on a farm in Nova Scotia. An inheritance and some wealthy friends freed her to focus on poetry and travel for the rest of her life, crafting gems like this one. Her Sestina is the first stanza, when at age 45, she was still very much processing her past. And while we're talking about childhood influences, can't forget the precocious primatologist, Dr. Jane Goodall, whose observations in her 20s of tool-making, tool-using, meat-eating chimps flipped a patriarchal scientific establishment on its head. Now, why chimps? Well, her research came as a result of who we love. Dr. Goodall developed a love for animals and chimps at a very, very early age. How early? When she was one year old, her father gave her a stuffed chimp doll from the London Zoo. They were inseparable. And as Dr. Goodall would do with chimps she befriended in Gombe nearly 25 years later, she gave her chimp a name. Like superheroes, every one of us, every one of us has an origin story. I'd like to leave you with one more example. It's about a guy named Steve. Steve grew up in California and lived by the sea. 
Steve went on to become a marine biologist. A marine biologist who liked to draw. And 15 years later, after landing his dream job as a marine biologist, on May 1st, 1999, at the age of 38, Stephen Hillenberg introduced the world to SpongeBob SquarePants. <laughs> Cezanne, Bartok, Bishop, Goodall, Hillenburg, SpongeBob. <laughs> we celebrate these men and women in a sponge, not just for their work, but for what their work represents, a dedication to a search, a deeply personal line of inquiry. You should notice it doesn't matter what discipline you're in or what approach you take or when you make your mark. What matters and what all 177 of these creative thinkers have in common is authenticity. We each have a unique timeline on which we plot a unique set of life experiences. So when it comes time to tap into yours, do things the way that you and you alone do them. This just happens to be what I do. What are you going to do with your timeline? Thank you.